So turning to this afternoon's session, we've got a, a brilliant guest in terms of Lord Hall, Tony Hall, who, as you will all know, was Director General of the BBC, having previously, some years back, been Chief Executive of News of the BBC, and a range of other jobs, including uh, Chief Executive of the uh, Royal Opera House and many other activities which are too lengthy to mention, but well <laughs> done. But like so many people, sorry, like the other speakers here today, Tony is on a very tight timetable, so we will be finishing at five to two, so that Tony can also catch a train to Liverpool, just like, uh, just like Charlotte Moore. <laughs> Why Liverpool, I ask myself? Why not Birkenhead, you should be saying. <laughs> Why isn't it happening in Birkenhead? But there we are, it's not. So Tony, I'd like to start with uh, a really interesting article you wrote in The, in the Guardian <coughs> uh, a week or 10 days ago. And sort of looking at your conclusions in that, there were three main things. First of all, looking at the, the process for appointing the chairman of the BBC, and then a, a bigger look at how you think the BBC itself should behave going forward. So on the, uh, on the chairman um, uh, issue, you said there should be a makeup of the panel supervising the appointment of the new chair, and that should be made public along with its members' political allegiances, if any. You said that the board of the BBC should be asked to approve the proposed candidate alongside the MPs of the Department of Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee. After all, as you say, she or he has to have confidence of the board in order to be effective. And then the third point was the broader one looking at the BBC, a debate about the future of the BBC itself, the future role and its funding, and that should also be taking place, which very much picks up, I think, some of the themes from this morning from both Tina Stoll and indeed from Charlotte. But do you want to talk, start with the appointment process for BBC chair, Tony? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think uh, there was a mid-term review of the BBC's governors going on at the moment. It was one of the things which was agreed to when um, I got a, an 11-year charter uh, when John Whittingdale was Secretary of State. And I think that's an opportunity for the review, which I think is being done by, by the DCMS, not with outsiders, to say, OK, we can make a change now. now you know, I, I was thinking to myself, could you have some independent commission or committee or whatever that could actually appoint the chair to get real independence? Then you sort of start thinking, well, if you do that, then people will be arguing about who's on that, and then you get into all sorts of trading and stuff. And I thought, well, there's two things which you could do right away. One is, um, I, I didn't know, it just might be my ignorance, who the panel were that chose Richard Sharp. Um, but I think we should know going forward who those uh, panel members are. Um, before they make any decision and to know what their background is and their, their, their politics and so on. So that you could be, so that we, who in the end are the beneficiaries of the BBC, can be certain there is a, 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 the degree of independence we want in that and, and scrutiny of, 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 of them, number one. The second thing is, um, it's a bit odd that um, on every board I've ever sat on or chaired, um, I mean, the chair is there at the discretion of the board. You know, the, 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 if it, can you hold the board is one of the key things as chair. So it struck me as uh, right, of course, that the um, chairman goes before the DCMS Select Committee. Absolutely right. But shouldn't the chair also go before the BBC board, who are there to guarantee um, the independence of the BBC? Uh, and if they're satisfied that person's going to guarantee the independence, then that's a, that's a, a, a second check. The other thing I was kind of thinking about, um, about this too, and this may be not for the midterm review, it might be for the, the, you know, the, 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 the charter review period in 27, is also the makeup of the board. Now, the makeup of the board at the moment has uh, basically four government appointed people on it for each of the nations, uh, and then the chairman. And uh, then there are a group of non execs, and then there's a number of executive directors. Um, and I wonder whether it would also help public uh, confidence in the board if you upped the number of non-execs who are independent, appointed by the BBC, uh, and reduced by, well, you probably can't reduce, in, in truth, the numbers that, that, that are appointed by the devolved administrations, or they still haven't got one for Northern Ireland. Um, you probably can't do that. In other words, up the numbers. Not that the board becomes completely unworkable and you need two sittings, but actually, um, you know, but to, to, for, for people to understand that the majority on that board are independent and are going to guarantee the independence of the BBC, which we all know, you know, at the core of, of the fracas over Richard Sharp uh, as chair, uh, I, I don't think it was what he did as chair, it was him getting the job as chair, and the perception is as important as, as, a, as a reality in that, which is why in the end he, he had to resign. Mm -hmm. I think there's actually one other thing, which is I thought the KC's report also made a really important point, which is don't get out there in the press the notion that there's a front runner or there's a preferred candidate. Because I know people who would have put in last time and people who said to me, 
yeah, but it's quite clear who's going to get it. I won't bother. And I think for these public appointments, uh, there really should be... Uh, I, I mean, you can't stop the press or the, anyone commenting on stuff. I've heard several but, names today, actually. Yeah, well, yeah, that's right. Well, so I've got a few as well. We've all got them. But, you know, but it should be, uh, you know, that sort of speculation about front runners yeah. and all of that. I, I think we want to make it as open as possible for whomever she or he to apply. And I think the KC was bang on the nail on that. In your long experience with BBC, did the board, in whatever form, either the current board, the trust, or the old governors, ever have a say of any kind? Um, before uh, transmission of anything or before you did something, no. And uh, uh, in, in the reform board, the unitary board, um, David Clementi, the, the then chair, was meticulous about that because uh, he, I mean, and it's there in the charter, the director general is editor in chief. Sorry, I meant in the context of uh, deciding the chair. Uh, decided, no, 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 any, no, no, any absolutely, absolutely. no. The, the governors, um, weirdly, uh, uh, I say weirdly, no, I just mean the governors, um, uh, had actually rather a good way of doing it, which is if you had a, a Tory chair, you had a, a, a Labour vice chair. Mm-hmm. And, and, in a, and in a sort of way, you know, with Juki Hussey uh, and Joel Barnett. And Michael Cox. And then Michael, Co- and Michael Cox, indeed. It, it's, it, it absolutely worked yes. uh, and, and, and was sensible. And I think that there's another model there, which is if you're going to have a Tory chair, should you have a deputy chair who uh, comes from the Labour Party or vice versa? Uh, anyway, this needs um, w- working through. But I think there was a balance in the governors, which was well understood. I think the governor's system was, was n- not right, but I think the balance in terms of composition was good. So even if the, this process that you're suggesting here was, uh, was adopted, can you see in terms of real politique the Prime Minister of the day actually giving up having the final say? Well, they ought to. Um, Realpolitik, I can't see it, but they ought to. Um, because again, I think the, the I mean, w- w- when I um, was Director General and would go abroad on various business uh, or, or was uh, President of the EBU, um, the thing which I used to really get annoyed about was when people said, you're the state broadcaster. No, we're not. We're, we're a broadcaster, the BBC, sorry, I'm not we. The BBC is a broadcaster paid for by everybody. Uh, and it should be independent, and its independence is fundamental, fundamental. Um, and uh, I think anything which uh, helps to reinforce that uh, is really important. When you then say, well, the Prime Minister um, appoints the chair, then there's a sort of wry grin, and, um, you know, and people think, well, is that really the independence that you, you, you keep talking about? So I, you know, can I see it happening? Probably not. Um, uh, I think Keir Starmer said interesting things on that. I think it'd be very good if the, the current Prime Minister said something interesting about that as well. But probably the right time to do that is when it comes up to uh, the Charter renewal uh, in 27. But I think the more you can do to show that the board of the BBC is independent, uh, the better. OK, can we turn now to the, the debate about the future of the BBC, or the, the, the debate that perhaps there should be? Because this came up a lot this morning in, in Tina Stalls. She believes the BBC has to go out and, uh, and make its case, decide what it is, what it's trying to do, before, or at least at the, at the very least in parallel with deciding mm-hmm. how and who it's funded by. Whereas Charlotte was saying a little bit more, well, she feels the BBC has been setting out its, its strategy pretty clearly over the last 18 months or so. What's, uh, what's your view of that? So, uh, I, I, look, um, having run the BBC, um, I know what it's like. You think you've laid out your case and you keep doing it and people keep saying, you know, you've not done this enough. I, I think this is a period when the BBC needs to go into campaigning mode, uh, to be quite honest with you. Um, and Charlotte's really, really good at that. And um, it needs to get out there, lay out the ground very clearly for why public service broadcasting and the BBC uh, really matters. Um, and I think there are, the, 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 there's a number of issues that they, they need to be very clear about. One is the funding issues. Um, you know, the, the idea of rushing towards a decision about the licence fee and about how to fund the BBC without actually deciding what is it that you want the BBC to do is nuts. I mean, you, you, you really, this is what I'm trying to argue in, in various places, you really need to say what is it that we want the BBC to do and to be uh, uh, post-27 and then how is the best way of, of funding that? As opposed to saying, let's get the funding mechanism right and then sort out what it's going to be. And I, I've, I've been through, I mean, myself, I think Mark Thompson, um, and you know, whatever happened before that, I'm sure, where the funding's been decided, and then you have a charter review to work out, now what are we going to do? Well, that's just the wrong way around. And I think, um, I think the, the select committee did a good report on funding, which led to some conclusions you might want to, we might want to talk about. But we've got to get that, uh, that, that reversed. And I also think the BBC 
um, is the best place to, to lead that because um, uh, I really do believe you set the, you've got to set the agenda, otherwise other people will set the agenda for you. And the agenda for the BBC into the next 10, 20 years, I think is amazingly strong, and I'm happy to talk more about that. But, but you know, we, 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 we've got to decide what it's for. I mean, the last funding settlement, um, you know, I, 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 my guess would be, and it's a guess, that Richard Sharp, with all his contacts, did the best deal he possibly could. But flat, cash flat for two years, uh, uh, followed by uh, inflation, is really tough for the BBC to manage. And, and when we all get grumpy with hearing about the change or cuts or what it happens to be, you've got to realise this is, this is a really tough settlement on top of two settlements, uh, Mark Thompson's when they, we took on the World Service, me when we were jumped with uh, the, the cost of the over 75s, uh, and now uh, cash flat. And, and, I, and that's why I, I think we've now got to turn it around and say let's have a debate about, about the sort of BBC we want. Because the consequences are, I mean there are myths around about the BBC. When you're sitting there running it, People tell you, you can be more efficient. Well, the NAO, and you know, I've had my battles with the NAO, actually came out with a really good report uh, it's sometime in November, when they basically said, up to 21, from a period from somewhere in the mid-teens uh, uh, to 21, we'd overachieved against uh, savings. And, and they also commended the BBC on having um, an overhead rate, i.e. management and that sort of stuff, rate of about 5%, which they said was in line with other, other organizations. So they gave it a really good, strong bill of health. They then went on to say, from now on, um, uh, the BBC can carry on making uh, efficiencies, because every organisation can. Every year, stuff happens, you can do something better. But actually, uh, the balance between pure efficiencies now and cuts to programmes and services, a third can come from pure efficiencies, probably, and two-thirds will come from programmes and services. Then you get the settlement of, of flat inflation. And then you start wondering, why is Tim having to do these, some of these difficult decisions? And the answer is, it's there in the, in the finances. You know, the, the notion that um, you can build up, uh, I mean, I set up BBC Studios. I'm really proud of what uh, BBC Studios has done because some brilliant programme makers in the NHU and others now can go and sell great things to, to uh, Apple, like the Dinosaur series, which I really commend, and, and other things as well. But even then, when you, you know, people say, well, that's the solution. You're going to build BBC Studios. Well, I think they're heading towards 2 billion turnover from about 1.2 when I set up BBC Studios, which is a good growth. <laughs> But even then, the margin that you're, well, the dividend or profit or whatever you call it in, a, uh, uh, in the BBC, I've forgotten, dividend, I think, G going back into the BBC is probably 200, 250. It can never, um, it's not the solution to balancing any books. So, you, you know, you've got that. And then I think the other issue you've got when you're managing the BBC is, um, is a recognition that um, not everybody uh, is going to be uh, able to make the digital transformation that, 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 that broadcasters, and I certainly would assume they can make, and the select committee I'm on, Tina uh, chairs, we're doing something on digital disadvantage uh, at the moment, a report will come out sometime in the summer. Um, but you know, what you get from that is, it's probably between seven and eight million people who are not gonna make that transfer, and they want DTT, and they want services as they are. And then you look at the actual data around BBC services, and actually, well, you know, it's 80, 82%, I mean, Andrew Scudding's in the room, he probably has a better, better figure than me, are still consuming uh, BBC on TV sets. And I think the, the figure for uh, Netflix is about 8% on TV sets. So, you know, there's a funny old thing going here. We're all rushing rightly to a, an online digital world, and yet we're also saying we quite like things as they are, TV and radio being consumed. So the notion that, you know, you kind of dream of, which you can turn off linear channels because then it's cheaper. You know, having to fill schedules is expensive. So one way of cutting costs is to say, we won't do that anymore. I mean, you know, I tried it with uh, BBC Three. Um, uh, it, basically, people, I think, are slower to want to make that change than, than maybe we often think. So all of those things are constraints on the BBC, which is why I think you, can't, you, you, you shouldn't start with the money and say, they've got too much, let's cut it. You've got to say, what, what is it that we want this, this, this amazing corporation to do? Some of us at the VLV feel <clears throat> the BBC is a bit reluctant when it's had a, a settlement, and a, you know, a pretty difficult settlement, to actually be upfront about the impact of that and to try to portray the settlement in the best possible light, which, which is understandable, because I know there will have been tough negotiations. Yeah. But nevertheless, might not it be better to say, well, we've got this settlement, it's pretty awful, it'll mean this, but it's the best we can do. 
I, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to advise my, my successor because Tim is, is, is doing a good job and I, I, you know, I don't want to get in the way of that. But actually, I would lay out uh, for, the, for, the, for the public, for all of us, because we own the thing in the end. I know we don't, but you know what I mean. We're, 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 the ownership is with the, with the license fee payers. Actually lay out exactly the, the, the funding and, uh, and, and what comes from where of the BBC and what you get for, for, for uh, what is there. Um, and then try to match that against the aspirations of what the BBC could do. Because my, my worry is, and I said it in the, in the, the, the Guardian asked me to write a piece about, they asked me for, a lot of people asked me for comments about Richard Sharp and all that, so I'm not doing that. And then it came back, the Guardian came back and said, would you just write a piece about the kind of what you think the, the, the state of the BBC is, but away from the fray, and I'm you know, content to do that. But I think the, 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 the real issue is to lay out uh, these, um, the, the financial constraints on the BBC, Involve the public because, in the end, you know we're all the license fee payers. Another, another big point we've been making. Yeah, yeah, really involve the public. And I see, having been the BBC, having been jumped with Mark, uh, you could say jumped with the over 75s with myself because all that happened in a in a extraordinary week. Um, and but, then, sorry, just pick up on that. Was that really within one week? Yes. that became an issue. Yes, I mean, I, uh, uh, um, John Whittingdale rang me and said, "Worst effect of uh, I've, I've lost the battle." And I said, well, this is nuclear, isn't it? And, uh, and nothing much happened for two days. Um, and then I went in to see George and Whittingdale and the then cabinet secretary, Jeremy Haywood, and uh, you know, we began uh, talking about what we were gonna do. Now, th then I think that was all concluded, if, if my memory serves me well, um, there's a song in that, um, uh, by Saturday night. Now that's, that really, I mean, honestly, that is not a way to settle something as big as the funding of something which I believe as is important to us all uh, as the BBC, which is why I think we have got to start, I'll say we, because you know, I believe in the organisation, I've got to start laying out now the issues around the BBC involving uh, the public, yourselves and others. Um, and I had a kind of an idea when I was at, at the BBC, which people, you know, I think thought I was probably nuts to suggest, but we're gathering people who uh, are using the BBC through the uh, iPlayer and also through Sounds, which is wonderful. Can we involve them likewise? And can, you, and can we expand on the number of meetings that you have with people? Get out there and argue about what people really, really want. Because I think if you come back in, I'm guessing, 25, 26, when the, 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 the charter gets renewed again, and you come back saying, well, we've done our thinking, uh, this is, these are the financial uh, uh, consequences of what the public have told us we want. That could be very, very powerful indeed. And you know what those things are. I mean, it's around news. We may be talking more about that, the World Service, but also local is really, really important. It's around our culture. Because we're English, I think, and not French, we tend to be looser um, about, uh, well, we can get stuff from Netflix on here, can't we? You know, if we were French, we'd see this as part of our patrimony. But culturally, the BBC helps us to define who we are through the things that we produce, through the things that the BBC does, through the coronation, th through uh, Eurovision. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it is a, a binding agent. And then the third thing is the, the BBC's role in the, in the creative economy, which is really important. And I'll happily talk more about that. But we need to lay this argument out and get people involved in it, because I think it's, it's, it's really important. In the end, you know, you don't, I mean, my worry is that the, 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 the something which really matters to the cultural life of this country um, uh, gradually, just slowly, slowly, I mean, it, lobsters and pots and all that stuff people talk about, I, I, I won't, well, I have. Uh, but, but, you know, it's that sort of gradual diminution of, of something which is important to our culture, which I, I, I care about. It seems to me, I, I had to do a really scary thing, which was we made a film, um, and uh, it was about uh, Shelley, Williams, Shelley Williams's mother. And we had a press showing of the uh, film, and we had it in a, in a little one of the viewing rooms somewhere. I can't remember where it was now. And I had to go and say, you know, welcome Shelley Williams, and this is the film, and you know, thinking, I hope you like it, and otherwise, whatever. And Shelley Williams at the end said something which I'll never ever forget. That only she could say it. I couldn't say this, as you say, pompous person. But she said, the, 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 the United Kingdom of Great Britain has given two great things to the world: Shakespeare and the BBC. Amazing. Amazing. And, and, you know, that's always resonated with me because I've thought, whatever you're doing, you, you know, you've got to live up to that. I won't pick her up and say we're actually British, not English. But, yes. Uh, but I just did. Yes, so, you so, did. Thank <laughs> you. Sorry about that. Quite right, too. <laughs> yeah. As an old Irishman. Yeah. So let, let, let's, let's turn towards the... Kingdomish. Let's turn towards the vision for the BBC then and what do you think its future role 
should be. Well, I, the, I, look, how, I mean, how should it redefine I, itself? I, I, look, I, I, I was saying earlier. I think there are three things. One is, um, you know, th there was a sort of period when people thought, you know, do we need BBC News and all that sort of stuff, and others will provide this for us. Well, I think what's been happening in the last year, in terms of the, that uh, rash of companies that sort of um, built themselves up uh, in the tens and are now either collapsing or in some chaos, shows that you, you need a place to go for uh, what has happened. And I always took um, a lot of comfort, you know, in, not in an arrogant way, but comfort from the fact that you know, people would come to the BBC, but they'd also come to the BBC to find out, I need to know the truth, this is, this is where I go to. Uh, and when I woke up this morning and listened to Trump, um, then I thought to myself, it's not like that here, but boy, do you need those places where you can go to. Um, I also think, and I, I was talking to, to a friend just in, in, in the lunch just now, I think the BBC is also a place where you want to get as broad an agenda as, as you can. I, I'm a fan of Tortoise. Uh, James Hardy was the director of news when I was at the BBC. I got him to come and do it at the BBC. I love Tortoise because it, it, it expands your horizons on stories, and I think that's a, a big role um, for the BBC too. Um, uh, and then you've got um, uh, local and, uh, uh, and international. I mean, I, you know, I could talk more about the, you know, the role of, of, of the BBC Journalism Network but in network terms, but the local radio and the local information is phenomenally important. I mean, um, we know, I've gone, I went round almost every, I think Swindon I missed, every other local radio station and every other um, uh, national newsroom. And um, what we, the BBC is doing there is phenomenally important, and believe me, no one else is going to do that. Um, and, and, I, and I think that, that it is one case of, of, of market failure, or the other way around, we're, we're actually making a market for, for, for news. And I set up a thing called the, the um, uh, 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 Local Democracy Reporter Scheme with John Whittingdale. It was part of the, the negotiation we had over the Charter, uh, which is producing lots of stories. It's actually helping not just the BBC to get stories on air, it's actually helping other local media to get stories on air as well. And that kind of partnership working, I think, is really interesting for the BBC. Then you turn around and say, um, the World Service, and it's great that the BBC's got more money for some uh, services in the crises that are going on at the moment. Um, but I remember going to, to, to uh, George Osborne after uh, the license fee settlement and just saying, I've got a cheeky ask, will you give us 85 million a year to support the World Service? And thinking, well, we might, I'll be honest with you, thinking we might get 40 or something like that. And he said, no, no, I'll do it. And that meant that it was the biggest expansion in the World Service since the Second World War. And when you went to India or when you went to Nairobi in, West Africa, in East Africa and you saw the new services and the audiences the BBC is reaching, it's brilliant. So now it's just under half a billion um, a week reached by the BBC. Now, this is something, you know, is too precious to be gradually cut away and lost. This is a really important part of post-Brexit uh, soft power that's important for us. So then that's one, so there's one argument there. Second argument, in my view, is around culture. And I think the BBC is a cultural organization as much as it's a media company. And um, giving uh, 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 ways in which um, our talent uh, uh, can find a voice is phenomenally important. So the fact that the BBC has, you know, uh, 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 you know the, the music introducing service on local radio, which led to Ed Sheeran uh, at Glastonbury, all those sort of things, looking for new talent, really, really important. Also, dramas that reflect who we are. I mean, actually, I really love gold. Uh, I've, I've been watching the Magpie Mysteries. These are things which I don't think um, the big streamers, and I like what the, many of the, of the things I'm seeing there and I'm watching those things are doing. This is stuff which is about us. And actually, you know, the best place to make sure that sort of uh, material is commissioned is by, is by having a BBC, let alone comedy, which um, is, is so difficult to do on an international sense. You know, and, our, and comedy is another thing which joins us together. And then on top of that, you've got, you know, Claire Popperwell and the brilliant things done with big events and that. All these things, and, and you could talk more about this. I mean, all these things, I think, are in, an essential part of the public service the BBC gives. And then... Uh, and then you've got education. And uh, I, one of the things, I, I, I mean, it, this is a bizarre thing to say, but one of the things which was a treat for me leaving the BBC was um, I, I had to transform the BBC in my last months uh, because of COVID. And the organization responded and turned on a sixpence. And, you know, we produced education services, we produced all sorts of things. Um, uh, we, we supported the arts with a service to get audiences to the arts. We did all sorts of things which you could only do if you have a public service organisation there ready to respond to those sort of emergencies. And, and watching the way that, that people within the BBC responded to that crisis, I mean, was brilliant and very heartwarming. Uh, I enjoyed it. So there's the second thing, which is, you know, the cultural issues around the BBC. 
And then the third thing is our creative economy. Look, I, I, um, uh, my first uh, week at the BBC ended um, at Rose Lock in Cardiff and uh, playing on Doctor Who's TARDIS, and I thought this is absolutely wonderful. <laughs> Love it. But if you think about Cardiff 20 years ago, the fact you now you can produce um, dark materials from a, an enormous uh, studio complex there, this is a huge change built around uh, the, the, a cluster built around an, a, an investment by the BBC. The same in Manchester, the same now at Tim's doing uh, uh, around Digbeth uh, in Birmingham. And that's, and I think uh, Charlotte will have will have said this probably this morning, but I think the fact now that six, I mean, they're aiming for 60% of the output to be outside Birmingham, uh, outside, sorry, outside uh, of London. Um, it, you know, that's an economic power in an area which um, uh, we are genuinely world beating, you know, and, and I think, we, you know, we need to recognize that and, uh, and, 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 and make sure we're funding it and, and uh, leading it properly. I want to uh, throw it open to questions shortly, but just before I do, perhaps broaden it out into looking at PSB more broadly, and looking, I don't know how much time you've had to look at the media bill so yeah. far, but do you think it does enough to help the PSB? Um, so, I mean, I, 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 I've looked at it. Um, I'm really interested in it. I think it does three things which I think are really important. I think the issues um, of equality, um, which I found Ofcom, I was arguing with Ofcom um, uh, a, a lot about when I was at the BBC, which is, um, you, you know, by regulating uh, the PSBs, uh, in the UK, but not seeing that actually the bigger picture is, you know, is that we're in a, di a global digital market with the Netflixes and others uh, coming in. I think that the extent to which um, uh, they are now part of, or well, if the, the bill goes ahead, they are now part of a regulatory regime is spot on. Um, it, you know, it struck me as odd that I, I, iPlayer was regulated and uh, or other streaming services weren't. So I think that seems to me is good. I think prominence is really important on smart TVs. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, again, in the generality, I think that's important. And I think the fact that radio um, has uh, prominence in smart speakers and services, and importantly in cars, is also important. Because I think we've got a very precious PSB ecology in this, this country. It works. It's the reason why I think we're so good in, in the screen sector, which is about a fifth, if I recall, of, the, uh, uh, of what the creative industries offer the economy. So I, I think it, it looks good. Now, there'll be all sorts of details, which uh, no doubt will be gone into. But um, uh, I, I uh, bumped into Stephen Parkinson uh, a couple of weeks ago and just said, uh, you know, I really hope this can, this can happen before an election, because I think, you know, it would be really good to get these things out there to safeguard and to help the public service ecology thrive in this country. Should audio content be regulated in the way that video on demand is? I mean, at the moment, you've got a vast uh, explosion of podcasts, sounds like radio, um, but it's not in any sense regulated. I mean, I think I think what, what um, I would say, and it's a really interesting question. I need to I need to think a bit more think more about that. I think w what I would want is equality of treatment. So um, if you have a large unregulated sector, uh, you know, done by Spotify or someone like that, and then you have a regulated sector by uh, the likes of the BBC or others, that wouldn't be right. Um, but, I, I, but I also think that, that some regulation is a good thing. Um, and that's usually unpopular to say that. But, and, you know, but I do think regulating for certain standards and certain qualities, um, I, I think, is, is, is important. OK, thank you. Open to questions from the audience now. As ever, please raise your hand, wait for the microphone, and please say who you are before you ask your question. Peter, to your left there. Hello, uh, Catherine Knox uh, from Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. Um, I, I was interested to ask you a bit about your reflections on, firstly, the fact that Channel 4 has not been privatized, what, what you think that might mean for the future of the BBC, um, and secondly, in terms of kind of building the case for the future of the BBC, do you see any merits to the introduction or funding of some sort of citizens' assembly? And do you think if that was a useful tool, that should be funded by the government, by the BBC? How, how could that be a useful approach? Well, really interesting question. So the citizens' assembly to, to do what? To defi help define the BBC's future? Look at the future of public service broadcasting and the BBC specifically. I mean, I don't know who should fund that, but I, it's exactly the sort of thing which I think would be really, really helpful. 
Uh, I mean, it's interesting when you look to Ireland and see some very big controversial issues that have been decided in Ireland using citizens' assemblies, as I understand, and things like that. So I think applying that to the BBC would be uh, really useful uh, and could surprise everybody. But I think, that, but I think it's a, a really um, interesting idea. On Channel 4, uh, I'm relieved it's not um, privatised. Um, I really am. I think, I think um, Channel 4 has a... And when I was on the Channel 4 board, and latterly as deputy, I, I, I felt it has a particular remit. I think uh, that the, the Channel 4 at the moment is doing a lot outside London. I think the lead stuff, I think the stuff around skills and, and uh, apprenticeships and stuff is really, really important. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad it's... You know, it, it, I, I, I never understood the argument says, you know, to compete with Netflix, Channel 4 needs to be privatised because it's not Netflix. I mean, it's something completely different. Um, and, uh, and I think what it's done... Uh, in terms of transforming the way that um, uh, film uh, and, and programmes are produced in this country um, uh, has got a lot more to do. I mean, I, I would encourage... I mean, I don't need to do this, Alex, but, but encourage them to do even more to find true indies and, and to use true indies as opposed to uh, the non-qualifying type. But, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm relieved it's, it's out of the wood and as a good future as it is. Thank, Thank you. you. Other questions? Yes? Peter? What do you think? There have been suggestions that the BBC adopts a sort of a hybrid funding model. You could subscribe for additional services. That certainly wouldn't be the VLV's view. But what do you think of that approach? Would it be a, a solution for, for their financial problems? So, um, uh, well, it, it is a hybrid model at the moment anyway. Um, you're getting some uh, dividend from uh, studios, which is good, um, and from the UK TV channels through studios. That's good. Um, my view is that's never going to fill the gap you need to sustain or uh, allow a BBC in the future to thrive in the way I think it should do. Um, you have got a little tiny bit of granting aid coming into World Service. I think the case for saying that the World Service should be funded by government wholeheartedly uh, is actually very strong. Um, uh, that's about 250 million a year. Um, uh, and actually, I would go beyond that. With Jeremy Hunt, when he was, he was Foreign Secretary, we had a great conversation um, about putting more money into BBC World Service to get to a billion people uh, uh, a, a, a week, as opposed to half a billion. And um, I saw him recently, of course, he's now Chancellor, but said, I haven't forgotten. But uh, I, 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 you know, he kind of got it when he was Foreign Secretary. So I think there's a case for looking at that. Um, and then you come back to the licence fee. I don't think a two-tier licence fee is a good idea. Really interesting, we had evidence, uh, Tina's committee, when I was in, we had evidence on that uh, from a number of people. And um, if you want to set up a sort of a, another tier of premium content, you've got to have quite a large amount of money to set up that content in the first place. Then you've actually got to spend quite a bit of money in getting people to, you know, marketing it, um, getting people to sign up, all the sort of things that go with uh, an on-demand service like that where you've got, you know, people having to pay. Um, and I, I, I think it will, de I think it will, one, wouldn't give you the, what you want. Two, will lead to all sorts of strange and medieval arguments about is that for pay or is it for free? And I think people will start to get quite you know, miffed if they think, well, why, you know, I'm still paying for the licence fee, but that's stuff I've got to pay premium for. And I think it's getting away from the core argument, which is what do you want the BBC to do and how do you fi to, 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 to fund it? Now, um, I don't know whether Tina got into this this morning, but the, the, the conclusions I think we came to on the select committee was really, um, you don't want to go for advertising, everyone agrees on that. You don't want to go for subscription, everyone kind of agrees on that. You're left then with, I think, two things, a licence fee or a household tax. Um, I was pushing like mad, as was John Whittingdale, for a household tax, because it's, it's even though the, the way in which you judge households' payments is anachronistic and way out of line with values, nonetheless, it, it gets into some area of proportion, but that was, we were, we were, that was, that was knocked out, down right away. So I think the issue, and let's begin the debate now, is um, uh, if it's a licence fee or it's a household tax, how do you make it fairer? And I think we've got time to think about it, because that really, really matters. I mean, one of the things I learned from you know, the over 75s and all that is, you need to make this thing fairer. And once you've given, uh, in that case, something free to the over 75s, but now brought back to those who are on, 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 on benefit, um, well, the argument for saying you should, you, you, you know, you, you, you shouldn't apply that for people further down the income scale, uh, I, I, I don't think you can, you, you can run with it. So I, I think the, the, the challenge, I think, is between now and 27 is to find a fairer way of paying household tax 
or license fee. And uh, boringly, I would go for license fee, but with some sort of gradation. Because I think there are people who would actually pay more. I mean, you know, I would for one. You mentioned that uh, commercial revenue <coughs> uh, through studios is a kind of hybrid funding. Um, is there a risk that with the emphasis on uh, BBC having to earn more from its commercial activities, that actually it lost some of the, the public service motivations? And if it's producing programmes to sell internationally, mm. is that a risk to the, the UK licence? Um, it, it's a risk um, because you know if you're going to do a, a big big drama, then uh, you have to find co-pros, um, and the volume of money you want them to find now is larger than when I went. You know, just over the last decade has got uh, larger. Um, but then, and it was the same in 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 opera land in a different sort of way. But if you're the producer, and if you're the the, the prime artistic driver, then uh, it's in your hands to make sure you're doing the things that you really want to do and really matter. Um, and then I think you've got to ensure that, um, you know, you can't just look all the time at margins and say, you know, because we have to make th this return to the, uh, to, to the you know, keep watching eBay and all that stuff, you, you've got to say there are some things which are not, not going to make us much money, but it's really important that we do them uh, and do them as efficiently as we can. And I think that's a balance within studios they've got to work through and which Tim has got to make sure uh, uh, is, is working through to his satisfaction. But I think overall, the driver of Charlotte as creative director, I mean, I, I, you know, I put Charlotte in, front of, uh, in, in, in charge of television because I just think she's, her creative drive is fantastic. That's what you've got to make sure you're, you're pushing for. And we both push for uh, dark materials. I think we were the only two people in the, <laughs> in the BBC, um, BBC board who wanted it because it was very expensive. But that was the case where you say, no, this is Philip Pullman had done something there which was archetypal of uh, British fantasy, you know? And, uh, and no one else is going to do that in the BBC. I mean, Hollywood tried, had one episode and dumped it. And I think, you know, so I, 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 I think, with, you know, with people like Charlotte and the, and the team, I, I, they continue to wrestle with that as a risk, but I really believe they'll, they'll kind of uh, deliver however hard it might be, harder it might be. Other questions? Right at the back there, Claire. Um, uh, Tony, hi, Claire Anders. Hi, um, Claire. Hi. I was wondering whether you thought there was any, there, there would be any bandwidth in the next few years for a review of the anachronistic nature of what is called a TV license, but what we, we, we know funds the websites, mm. the news services, mm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and obviously radio services, mm. every business consumes the website. Mm. Um, you know, if there was, th this is something that has also allowed about two million people to claim that they no longer watch mm. TV on the TV set or on a PC, which when, when they can just get in their cars and listen to Radio 1. So, and, and indeed go and use BBC material at, at, at their place of work or, or, or anywhere else. So do you think that, I mean, we, we I think, agree that we're in a benign to, <coughs> to, to, to slightly more positive dialogue route, much mm. more positive dialogue route than we were, say, uh, under the Liz Trust government. Oh, gosh, yes. Mm. And, and I, I think we all know that. Um, <laughs> no, no, I, yeah, I, 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 I have had many mm. messages with Jeremy mm. Hunt on those matters. The, mm. The license fee is safe, uh, mm. et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I feel very, very that there is a positive momentum with this mm. government to examine a number of options yeah. which haven't been considered before. But I really do think that this this double problem the BBC faces, the two million people who have opted out saying we, mm. we know, don't use any BBC mm. services when we all know that's not true. Mm. And secondly, the ability to broaden the base of premises that pay is is there is there any feeling as a crossbench peer that that would be doable because that would inevitably very substantially increase the number of premises that pay the license fee i think it's a really uh, good idea uh, i'd go along with that broadening it away from television uh, i've always thought it odd because you know radio to my mind, matters as much as uh, television. The other uses uh, that the BBC that we put the BBC to would be would be brought in by that. Um, and I think, I mean, I, I and and I just I would add to it if there's a way of um, also making it proportionate to people's ability to pay. I think you've got a solution there, which I think is really interesting and well worth doing. And the reason, Claire, why why I think um, 
there's an urgency because uh, because you know you can say what the hell is he on about it's 23 at the moment and you got till 27. i just know how the debates crunch in and suddenly there's not enough time to think about this stuff and i think to have uh, thinking now about how you can fund the BBC and for what, so that people have got you know two three years to to be to, 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 to for those arguments to have been socialised and to, to have been thought about properly is really really important. And I'd put that in in the in the locker as one of the things I'd, I'd uh, really explore. Well, it w it would solve the problem yeah. without without actually becoming a punitive event for any household today. Mm. Yes, I I I I think that's a very good idea. I'm going to have to... One very, right. very, very quick question, Peter, because Peter. Tony's got to go just before two. Tony, you and Charlotte Moore have put forward very well-articulated arguments for the BBC for its role and about the debate on its funding. Why is it that the BBC itself won't touch these questions? Um, I really don't know, uh, uh, Peter. Um, and I, I, I remember when I was running the BBC, people said, you know, you've got to get out there all the time. And you think, well, I'm out there talking about the BBC. I, I, I think um, we as friends, I, I think in this room of public service broadcasting and the BBC in particular, uh, need, need to make these arguments. And we need to make them now. And I think it's really, really important. And you know, when you're running an organisation as complex as the BBC, you know there are so many pauses on your time. But I just believe profoundly that now, with some years to go and through an election, so people will be writing manifestos, is the time for the voices to be heard of those who really support the BBC and public service broadcasting. It is not an archaic, antique uh, uh, idea whose time is done. Quite the reverse. I think everything that is happening. Uh, from news through to culture through to the creative industries says the BBC and the public service ecology around Channel 4 and so on is really valuable going forward and we've just got to make that argument and find every way we can to do so. Yeah. Well, I can't think of a better note on which to end. Thank you very much for that. Thanks, Tony. It's been absolutely Pleasure. fascinating. And just wish you a good trip to Liverpool. Yeah, well, I hope the trains are working. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Bye-bye.